Hello everyone and welcome to Eorzea Armoire, a series about the background of some of Heidelin's more epic and dense weapons, armor and artifacts. We'll be investigating the lore of these items both within Final Fantasy XIV and the Final Fantasy franchise in general, as well as the amazing and sometimes obscure real-world people, events and artifacts upon which they are based. Tupsamadi has featured in Final Fantasy XIV since 1.0, being the main weapon of Louis Soir Le Velieux. It is only very recently, however, that the significance and power of this artifact has been realized, attaining greatly to both the past and future of Eorzeon. This video will later contain spoilers, and I will clearly indicate these sections, make them easy for you all to skip, uh, but first we will cover the spoiler-free background and etymology of the staff of Louis Soir. This Tupsamadi is honestly a pretty unassuming weapon, a fairly standard horn staff, the head to which is attached a tablet that could easily be palmed, inscribed with the mark of Thaliak. Thaliak is the god of rivers, wisdom and knowledge, and patron of the Charlian scholars. Louis Soir's possession of an icon of Thaliak serves to remind us of his once prominent position among the Charlians and the fact that although he has left his brothers and sisters to come to Eorzea and lead the circle of knowing, he is still a faithful and champion of Thaliak. Despite Louis Soir's ever apparent brilliance, it is unlikely that he personally crafted the Tupsamadi and it is more probably an ancient and prized relic of the Charlians despite its modest appearance. The reasons for this inference uh, should become clear soon enough. Final Fantasy XI's Tupsamadi is a level 75 mythic weapon for the Scholar, similarly inlaid with a stone tablet and its item description includes the titillating subtext, Omniscience. Unless you are very new to the channel, I'm sure you know where we're going next. The pinnacle of the ancient Mesopotamian pantheon is known as Enlil. His list of titles and epithets include the Great Mountain, Father of the Gods, King of the Lands, the Ever-Respected, Lord of Abundance and Lord of Destinies Nominator of Kings. Being the kind of dualistic deity that was capable both of bestowing great gifts and of whimsical annihilation, much of the primary literature written about him is to be found in the form of poems intending to flatter and appease him, to earn his favour and ease his anger. Even the other gods made regular offerings to Enlil in deference. Enlil's authority, however, is neither immaculate nor baseless. He holds a tablet which decrees command of the whole world, inscribes the entire and unalterable destiny of the universe as it is willed by the possessor, the tablet Tupsamadi. Enlil was worshipped as the supreme deity of the Mesopotamian from the 4th millennium BCE right until the 18th century BCE, so over 2,000 years, when the first dynasty king of Babylon, Hammurabi, penned a creation epic during which Enlil bestowed upon the god Marduk, patron of Babylon, the Enlil ship of all people after he defeated the goddess Tiamat and constructed the world from her body. Tiamat herself makes standard recurring appearances through the Final Fantasy franchise as a multi-headed dragon and often a keeper of the wind. So we might yet see her as one of the, the seven spawn of Midgard Sorma in Heaven's War. Having proved a worthy inheritor of the universe, Tupsamadi is handed on to Marduk as both the justification and the source of his supremacy. All of the Relic and Zodiac weapons available to the Warrior of Light so far in Final Fantasy XIV are impressive tools inspired by heroes and champions of legends, but Master Lavellier's Tupsamadi is on another level entirely. It's a name and inspiration taken from the master key to the universe. Comments have been made recently that as a narrative device, the staff is the ultimate uninspired deus ex machina, and that might be true, but upon reflection, it seems to me that the importance of this artifact has long and carefully been planned by the development team. To understand the Tupsamadi much further, we must cover what will be considered spoilers by anyone who has either not finished Turn 12 or not finished the story quest for Before the Fall Part 1. 
If you fall into only one of these groups, I don't think you'll be too upset for continuing. But all the same, you have been warned. If you do wish to skip this section, I'll give you a moment to do so now before I continue. During the Battle of Cardano, upon the release of Bahamut from Dalamud, Louis Soir Le Velio calls upon the power of the Twelve to cast a mighty seal in a desperate attempt to contain the Elder Primal. As we all know, this last ditch strategy failed and Louis Soir somehow managed to produce a glimmer of strength to recall the Warriors of Light before Cardano was consumed. It was generally assumed that it was the strength of prayer throughout Eorzea which summoned the Twelve like to beacons, ontologically distinct as they have so far presumed to be from primals, requiring no physical source of power to materialize and nothing but their own compassion to protect their faithful children. Recent events, however, cast a great deal of doubt, both on this presumption and on theories regarding the nature of the Twelve. Nabriales, upon discovering that Midgard Sorma had nullified the blessing of Hydaelyn upon the Warrior of Light, immediately moved to claim the broken Tupsamadi from a shrine at the Rising Stones. He already understood what Minfilia would soon realize and confirm that the tablet affixed to this relic of Louis Soi was capable of drawing upon such massive stores of ether from the surrounding land and air that could, if utilized in places of sufficient concentration, far exceed that which could be safely or reasonably stored within any body or even within a far greater quantity of ether crystals than had ever been found necessary to summon a primal. Indeed, to use the Tupsamadi as a substitute for a crystal hoard would be a simple thing in the wrong hands. So great is its capacity that Nabriales intended to use it to bring about the reawakening of the elder primal, Zodiac. The source of the ether that fueled Louis Soir's attempted seal was not the prayers of Heidelin's children calling upon the Twelve then, but the Tupsamadi itself drawing upon the abundant ether from the many assembled and fallen warriors, the breaking land, and the shattering Dullamud. The almost immediate failure of this seal caused the ether produced to scatter, but here, the overwhelming quantity of prayer focused upon the actions of Louis Soir and the deliverance of Eorzea from total destruction caused this unresolved power to be drawn back into Archon Levelier, summoning within him the primal of the qualities for which were being prayed, the immortal Phoenix. Louis Soir became the host for Phoenix in much the same way that Iceheart does for Shiva, and after a fiery, intense battle, he tore through Bahamut clean and attempted to surrender his life and ever back to the land before Bahamut, despite his death throes, managed in desperation to grasp a great enough quantity of this ether that could sustain a glimmer of life within his broken form for the elegant binding coils to find, and denying death to the both of them, he dragged Louis Soir with him plummeting into the bowels of the earth. So Louis Soir's unassuming Tupsamadi saved the realm from total annihilation at the advent of the Seventh Umbral Era, and before the fall part one reveals it as a natural form of the Light Blade which Moonbreeder was attempting to create. Seemingly, it can permanently dispatch an Asian that has been drawn into a prison of white aurasite. Twice already, it has proved to be Final Fantasy XIV's greatest Deus Ex Machina, and there should be little doubt that it is the single most powerful portable artifact that we have seen in Eorzea to date. Although we could have guessed at the power of the Tupsamadi previously from its namesake alone, now that its true purpose and potential has been revealed to the Warrior of Light and the Scions, we can be certain that many a battle will be fought over it yet. And that's all I've got for you today. Thanks as always for watching, and happy Australia Day! If you're enjoying this series, then please like and subscribe if you haven't already. The feedback that I receive does directly influence the content that I'm producing. Uh, so that said, if you have any questions or requests, thoughts and suggestions, anything, leave a comment below, and I'm sure it will as always produce some really great discussion. Until next time, I am Ethis, and this is Eorzea Armoire.